Mike Wagner, welcome to the Front Row Dad podcast, brother. I'm so happy that you're here. Oh, man, I'm happy to be here. So good to see you as always. So let's first by, start by telling everybody out there listening that you're one of my favorite people now. 2020, we got to know each other a lot better. You stepped up in the brotherhood. Um, many of the guys became Mike Wagner fans. You led an alternative education call that was recently voted one of the top uh, most valuable calls of the year. That was your idea. You hosted it. You recruited some people to share. It was um, it was awesome. And then you you showed up big to a retreat, and you you brought value. You listen. You share wisdom. You're a great man, and I'm I'm honored to be doing life with you right now. Well, man, I appreciate the kind words, and and the feelings are more than mutual. I uh, I tell you, I. I love front row dads and everything it stands for. And, and selfishly by showing up the way you've described, I get more out of it than, than I could ever contribute. And, and uh, so I'm not, I'm not about to change any of that. They are pumped to be hanging with you next week. I can't believe that we're just like, <laughs> we're seven days away, uh, which is awesome. Um, finalizing the agenda, like putting the, the, the finishing touches on it today and it looks incredible. So um, really, really looking forward to you and just, I mean, it's six of us, which is incredibly cool. Um, that's gonna be fun. Let's talk a little bit about your history. Because one of the things I know, but a lot of our listeners won't, is that you've had a really interesting journey to be where you are today, uh, a family man with a business and a very successful business at that. Talk to us a little bit about specifically your personal development journey. Um, who was Michael Wagner and who is the man today and what happened to transform all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate you asking that. And, uh, you know, I would probably say my personal development journey, if you will, started, oh, maybe five, six years ago, when uh, I was very fortunate in, in my world of self storage investing, I was fortunate to experience a, a pretty significant and rapid level of success that put me in a position to, well, I guess it gave me the space to, to explore, okay, what do I really want my life to look like? And, and prior to that point, I had, I was a, a, I was a guy who was pretty darn good at jumping through the hoops. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I bought hook, line and sinker, all the messages that the world gives us, right. Go to school, get a good job. That'll give you a good paycheck and, and you'll be able to buy some sort of happiness and fulfillment in your life. And, and so I played that game right up through college. I got three degrees, including a doctoral degree. And, and then I uh, started practicing as a, as a physical therapist. And while I loved helping, you know, grandma and grandpa recover from X, Y, Z, whatever that may have been uh, over time. And actually pretty quickly, I realized I felt like something was just off. I don't want to paint this picture that I was, you know, despondent in the fetal position or anything. I had a great life. My, my beautiful uh, wife, we didn't have kids at the time, but we were comfortable. I just felt uh, let off is the best word I could describe. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, I transitioned to real estate investing and ultimately found myself investing in self storage. And thankfully that was, um, that was the impetus to uh, me starting to explore what more could there be? W what can I achieve during this life that if I don't follow all the rules, right? Uh, and, and I'm just incredibly grateful since then. It's been such a huge, hugely inspiring and fulfilling journey. Every day I get to wake up and it's, it's basically a get to instead of a have to. And the things I get to do are spend time with my wife and kids explore personal development with guys like you and the rest of the brothers, um, travel the country. Like basically we have freedom now and we choose to kind of dedicate that freedom toward creating what we would describe as a life of awesomeness. Mm. How much time do you devote to personal development each day or each week? And, and has that remained consistent for a while or does it go through seasons? It, it, well, there's with, with three kids under under seven, there's absolutely some ebb and flow to it, no doubt about it. 
Uh, but a lot of my personal development right now is within that role of, of father and husband. And so um, it's not like they're mutually exclusive. Um, generally speaking, I'll paint my, my picture of a perfect day. If we're going to pretend eight hours a day is where I need to be quote unquote productive. Um, I like to spend one to two hours worth of uh, time getting my bills paid, doing the things that are necessary to maintain my current business operations. I like to spend about two hours um, in the realm of self-care, meaning um, exercise, meditation, prayer, yoga, those types of things, like nourishing me. And then the other four hours are for a combination of what's next. So maybe a couple hours to that. And then dedicated a couple hours of personal development. I would throw this conversation with you in the realm of personal development, just because we enter this, uh, this cycle of giving and receiving and creativity and, and ideas emerge. We have no idea what they might be at this moment, but um, those all fall into that bucket. So having, having meaningful conversations with people is, is one of my favorite things to do toward the end of personal development. What's one thing you learned in the last year that had a significant impact on your personal growth? Oh man, that is a, an awesome question and a loaded one. How many hours you got, brother? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, See you at the end of the show. Yeah, I think that the biggest the biggest thing for me was something I actually learned a little over a year ago, and and it was um, if I give you just a little bit of context, one of my personal development journeys, and probably the biggest one was. Um, trying to uncover what was underneath this occasional feeling of, I'm going to call it a funk. I would end up in a funk, whether it was feeling detached from my wife, feeling short with my kids, uh, really just um, not myself, if you will. Now, 90% of the time, I'm going to use that number. It's not always true, but on average, 90% of my time, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm doing what I need to be doing my the way I spend my time and my money is in alignment with my values and, and all is good, right? It's that elusive feeling of flow uh, that I'm to some degree tapping into most of the time. And then there's this 10% of the time where I don't, I don't believe I'm going to say this to an audience as large as yours, but there's 10% of the time where quite frankly, the feelings I have approach self-loathing where I'm just, I don't like who I am. I'm, I'm detached, I'm constricted, I'm closed off. I'm not the husband I should be. I'm not the father I should be. And, and I've been trying to explore like what's happening there? What's underneath all that? And a little over a year ago, I was fortunate to have an experience where, where I, I was gifted the realization intellectually of what a, a missing link might be. And, and that was great. And I'm not discounting the importance of coming to that understanding. For me, uh, having the intellectual understanding is critically important, but, but that's where it ended for me. Um, and it was just very recently, I was fortunate enough to uh, be introduced through John Berghoff in exchange uh, to a guy named Dr. Danny Friedland, who wrote the book Leading Well from Within. And it was a three-day event that I did with Dr. Danny and, and John Berghoff where Dr. Danny's content and uh, the exchange methodology came, came together and created this magic for me where that intellectual understanding that I had moved from my brain down into my heart. And I, I started to understand that, okay, not only do I need to know that underlying this feeling of funk that I have is a conditional self-love, a lack of grace and forgiveness that I would so willingly extend to, to you or anybody else. I was withholding that from myself. And so intellectually, I got it about a year ago. And then Dr. Danny was able to move it down into my heart in a there way that I can never repay him for. God, so many things that I've learned intellectually over the last 20 years that finally, when it gets to your heart, you're like, oh, that that's what they meant. Yeah, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I get it. That, and that's why it's not habitual or that's why it's like, I keep doing the same shit. I keep reacting um, versus responding. And that's because when you get it intellectually, when you're, when you flip, you know, your lid and you're not 
operating from your prefrontal cortex and all of your intellect goes right out the window. Like who cares that you get it intellectually? Right. You're, if you're operating out of your reptilian brain, then you better lean on your heart because that's where, that's where the fuel is going to come from. Um, yeah, this is all good. Let's provide a little context for Berghoff that you just mentioned. Um, so John Berghoff, a member a founder, he's part of our Founders Council for Front Row Dads. He was one of the initial guys to lead our very first meeting. One of my best friends in the world started a company called Exchange. Um, and they use a methodology that he learned years ago called Appreciative Inquiry from David Cooper Ryder for how to facilitate um, change at scale through asking better questions and learning the best of what was, what is, and what could be. Am I missing anything with that, by the way, or is that? No, I think you nailed it, man. It, it, if, if it's possible to capture what exchange is in words, you almost did it. Now, I would argue you've got to experience it to really fully That's grasp right. it, but you nailed it pretty well. Yeah, if you lead groups, you, something you should look into, and it's the letter X change um, if you wanted to check it out. We can link to that in the show notes. And Dr. Danny, who Berghoff has been talking about for years, was um, uh, and, and, and found his way to the stage with that group with this special event. Can you also tell everybody, Michael, what is going on with Dr. Danny and what made this event a little extra special? And then let's get into some of his material and what you learned from that experience. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I met Dr. Danny through the exchange uh, event. I think it was back end of October, early November. And, and uh, it, it really intrigued me because one, I'm, I'm a big fan of exchange, but Dr. Danny's book, Leading Well From Within, talks about kind of the, the intersection of neuroscience and mindfulness and, and how if we understand where those things meet, we, our ability to, to lead not only others, but as the title of the book would imply, lead yourself from within. And that's what creates a powerful leader in the world. Um, our ability to do that is amplified. And um, I did not know this until just a, a, a day or two before the event, but uh, very sadly, Dr. Danny was diagnosed. Uh, I came to learn about two to three weeks before the event itself. Um, he was diagnosed with uh, what's thought to be a terminal brain cancer. And that, it, I, I am going to have a hard time articulating how powerful of an experience it was to watch, not only learn Dr. Danny's content from him within the context of exchange, but to also witness his real time implementation of the things that he was teaching us while faced with, I mean, one could argue without much pushback, the biggest challenge that anyone can face. Yeah. And as a dad, you know, um, do you think about death? But I, I want to get into his content, but I've got to ask, like, is, is death something you think about when you do? Is it debilitating? Does it paralyze you? Does it push you? That's an excellent question. And, and um, I might be an odd bird in that I, I wouldn't say I think about it a lot um, overly deeply. Uh, I have in the past, uh, my father passed away when I was seven. So it, it's part of who I am. And that was a, a major inflection point in my life, clearly. And, and um, a lot of the personal journey and personal development journey I've been on since then is rooted back to some of the, that trauma and wounds. Um, but what I, the role that thoughts around death play in my world right now is one of, of actual inspiration. And, and I was reminded recently that I used to be better at this than I am today. Um, but I believe that my best life is the one that changes the least. If I get that tragic news, like Dr. Danny did, if I get that news tomorrow, my best life is one that doesn't change all that much from a day-to-day -day standpoint. That's kind yep. of the, the metric I use to judge how in alignment am I with my deepest values. Mm. Yeah, I do. That's such, you know, when I, I think about, I think, I don't want to say I think about death often, but I think about my life being very finite quite often. And I'm very attracted to the 
that the ideas that people have, how to keep that top of mind so that I don't just look at my Saturday as like, well, it's just another Saturday. We'll get many of these and you know, who cares what we do with this one. But, you know, shout out to Jim Shields, who I've talked about often on this show and his company name is 18 Summers. And that says a lot just in the name of the company. I just had this idea. I got to tell Jim, It'd be awesome to have a poster or a, a, an eight and a, eight and a half by 11 that has each kid's name and then just 18, you know, columns. And each year you just check off one and you can just be conscious that, look, you get 18 summers. And the reason that, um, that the reason that I think that understanding something is finite, your life, your, your, your kids, ad, you know, your kids being a toddler or a teen or all these things is that. For me, it serves two reminders. One, I better show up today because I don't know how many days. And that's quite cliche and a little bit of a platitude. Um, but the other one is the reverse side of it, which is sometimes when you're in the thick of it and you're like, this is never going to end. Remember that it will because this too shall pass, right? So sometimes that's a reminder of like, hey, hunker down and, and, and sink your teeth in and enjoy this. And the other one is like, hey, just breathe because <laughs> this will be... This is one day going to pass. I remember when I was a teenager, I was just ruthless. And my parents, I'm sure, were in that phase going, I don't want to cherish this. I want to get the fuck through this. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I, I pray to God that my kids don't grow up to be the teenage version of me. Right. Exactly, <laughs> dude. Me too. Me too, man. Um, all right. Let's talk about the, let's talk about some of your takeaways from Dr. Danny. And what does it mean to understand the neuroscience, uh, the intersection of neuroscience and mindfulness? And feel free, as you approach this, may, should we unpack what, what, how do we see neuroscience and mindfulness? Like, I'm curious as to the definition that you give to those two terms before we get into what he teaches. Yeah, we could certainly do that. And I think it, it's it's uh, valid and probably appropriate for those terms to have nuanced definitions, depending on the, the context of the yeah, conversation, exactly. right? Uh, but as far as Dr. Danny's work, uh, in this is a uh, very robust oversimplification of, of what he describes in his book. But um, generally speaking, he's, he's looking at mindfulness as, um, as being present and identifying where we're at at any given time. So yeah. am I reacting, to use your words from before, or responding? Am I choosing my response or am I autonomically reacting? So it's um, in order to, for that to make sense, we need to have at least a baseline understanding of the neuroscience behind it all, right? And he breaks down a couple different things. One is that as our brain has evolved over time, uh, we went from whatever we were way back when, where all we cared about was survival and and running, you know, running down prey and running away from predators. Um, we've evolved, and uh, now we have much greater needs than just that. Certainly, those are the first needs we need to meet. But and, and he references an adapted version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So from there, then we need to go to security and safety and then up into community and belonging and esteem and ultimately fulfillment and into transcendence. And what Dr. Danny says is, is our brain developed um, in a way where the most recently evolved parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, though the, that portion of our brain is responsible for our highest level needs. And then we have this reptilian or, or lizard brain um, that is the oldest part of our brain. And it is responsible for our, getting our basic needs met, right? And um, that's essentially our survival brain. Uh, it's the one that turns the rest of our brain off when we need to run away from the tiger. And mm -hmm. what happens these days is uh, we don't run away from tigers very often. Fortunately, that's not a thing for most of us, right? But our Unless brain... you're the father of one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Either running toward or away from, depending right. on the context, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, but what, what happens is our, 
a lot of us, Dr. Danny would suggest, because we're not mindful of it, spend way more time using too much of our survival uh, ancient lizard brain rather than allowing our prefrontal cortex to override that and, and put us in a position to be aware of and choose how we're responding to the various stressors or triggers or uh, occurrences within our life. Mm. All right. Real, real talk for a minute. What throws you right now? Do what bothers you? If you do get triggered, what is it? It is my oldest son, seven-year-old William. Um, it, it, and if I had to point to the thing, it's defiance, like outward defiance. Um, Dude, as you say that, the sign above your right shoulder is storage rebellion. <laughs> yeah. I, I know it's, it's, me, I just pointed to the part of my son that is most like myself. Exactly. That's the yeah. thing that bugs me so much. Of course. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, cool. I get that. You know, I've been sitting with this lately, and I shared with you as we launched into this episode that even just within the last 48 hours for me, I, and I told you I'd wait to tell you this on the show, but it's like, so Tatiana and the boys went to Key West. It was just a mother and boy trip, right? That just five days hanging out, going on a boat, you know, just all that eating key lime pie. <laughs> it was a good time. I was at home crushing it, right? And, and this is all intentional, by the way. I wanted that space. I was excited to dig in and I organized the house, the garage, the game room, the like, I just, I crushed it, right? And I sent her flowers. I felt like, look, I always know there's room to improve, but I look back, I was like, I'm really proud of myself for the work I did. She gets back. I even like the internet was having problems. So I called Google Fiber and I was like, we need to fix this. Well, they put this router, they got this new system. The guy was trying to explain to me how he set it up, but I didn't have the bandwidth to, no pun intended, to handle all this right now. But apparently the router ends up like right next to the wall where my son sleeps. And my wife corners me yesterday or the day before and she says, hey, are you in a place where I can talk to you about something? And I knew that's like, here's a criticism, but I'm like, yeah, I'm sure I'm good, it hit me. And she launches into her, why did you put the internet right next to the kid's room? You know, do you not care about their health? They're gonna get brain cancer, et cetera. And I can feel myself reacting almost immediately. And what I, what I get to, so I react, I end up raising my voice. I'm like, I'm, I'm basically dishing it out to her and what I learn in the end, that I'll, I'll fast forward to my coaching call with my coach, Nathaniel Shockin, amazing coach, by the way. He helps me understand that in the end, here's what it was. It was that I, I did, I was like, I kept saying, why does she only see the one thing I failed at when I did a hundred things right? And he has me understand that it's actually me that has a problem with the fact that I failed on the one thing and I did a hundred things right. So this is not her, I'm just projecting my own inner dialogue and how tough I am on myself onto my wife, right? That that's how it's, she is my projector for it. But that really the work is within me to understand how, how, uh, the, the lack of compassion that I have for myself. And while that you could argue that has served me and, uh, and a projects that I've worked on that very, very high standard, it has also created what I experienced very similar to you, Mike, which is a lot of times I'm great. Like I'm, I am living a front row life as I've designed it to be. And yet 10% of the time, even in the last three years, I've thought about what it would be like to end my life. Because for some reason, it's like, not enough. And I, I'm actually astounded that I even have a thought like that. I'm like, what is, then I beat myself up for having the thought. <laughs> so um, I wanted to share that because I think that the work that we are talking about right now of responding and reacting and our inner voice and mindfulness and what's happening chemically in our body what's happening with these neural pathways and how they were formed at a young age and what's being reinforced as an adult is 
really an important dialogue and ties into our emotional intelligence pillar of front row dads that I think a lot of men, specifically as it relates to their family, they, we don't get enough attention on this. Yeah. And man, I'll tell you, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and that's why I love front row dad so much is because it's a place where we can have these conversations that the rest of the world, largely not everybody, right? This isn't the only place to do it, but it's one of the rare places where we don't sweep this conversation under the rug, right? We admit it. We don't, Oh, how's everything? Everything's fine. And just leave it at that. We, we dig in and, and do the hard work required. And what you just described was essentially a perfect example of one of the key concepts that, that I learned from Dr. Danny. And that is, right, you were triggered, right? And uh, though you weren't physically threatened per se, it created a reaction in you. And that reaction is trigger response, trigger response. It's this cycle. And, and I think, I'm, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I heard you describe kind of a downward spiral of a cycle, right? The opposite of what we would hope if, if we're in a tough spot, we want to emerge out of it. But the challenge is when all of us, and we could use stress or anxiety, or in, in uh, I think it's also very pertinent to talk about the self-doubt element of it all, right? Because uh, you mentioned, you know, the thoughts that you've had, these, these you know, self-harming potentially thoughts, when we have those thoughts, generally speaking, we don't feel better ev- about ourselves as a result of those thoughts, right? Yes. Like that is, if I have a, self, a, a self-doubting thought, then I'm mad at myself for doubting myself because I know what my real potential is, right? And I, I lack the ability to demonstrate compassion to myself, right? And in that moment, if I can't give it to myself, I can't give it to anyone else either. So now- Yes. John Roman described his inability to to give himself compassion. Now there's no way you can give it to Tatiana in those moments. And now we're just in a tangled mess of downward spiral, right? Yes. So what Dr. Danny talked about, which I found probably if I had to point, there were so many golden nuggets, but if I had to point to one, it was his assertion that if we can, one, use mindfulness to first become aware when those triggers are, are surfacing for us and then use mindfulness to reframe and redefine either stress or self-doubt, whatever that trigger is in the moment, to redefine it in a way that allows us to use it toward f- as fuel to extract us out of that downward cycle and into an upward cycle, which is uh, essentially instead of a trigger response cycle, it's a, a giving and receiving cycle. And it's the one that that propels us upward through our higher human needs of community, belonging, love, esteem, fulfillment. And so it's really all we're talking about right here is identifying where we are um, relative to those two, those two cycles, and then choosing to exit the non-beneficial one through reframing stress and self-doubt and moving ourselves into uh, the positive upward spiral of creativity. And and not to mix too many frameworks here, but uh, Jim Dethmer, who was on the podcast and has a great episode, one of the top 10 rated, you know, about being present, his work with conscious leadership leads us to the question of, okay, am I a below or above the line, right? So am I in a reactive, triggered, threatened, fear-based state, or am I above the line, open to receiving, loving, you know, creative? Um, So you one, where are you? If you're below the line, can you accept yourself for being below the line, you know? And, uh, and if you can accept yourself, then are you willing to shift, right? Because you can't shift something that you can't fully accept in many ways. So one of the things that Nathaniel teaches me, and it sounds like what we're talking about here with redefining or, you know, uh, reframing is his work is based on Byron Katie the inquiry work, right? Which is a lot about turning things around. And let me give the practical example of that. So when I say I need Tatiana to see the good in me, Nathaniel has me turn it around to say, um, I need me to see the good in me. So I think that a lot of times, so the practical takeaway here, 
I think could be for men is anytime that you start saying like, I need my kids to blank. I need my wife to blank. I need my team to blank. (laughs) That a lot of times you can play with how might it be true that you need you to whatever it is. I need Tatiana to talk more, to speak nicely to me, to speak with respect. I need me to speak to myself with respect, right? Um, All of that is like, is the work. So he sends me an email following our coaching session the other day. He's like, here's your living turnaround, which is really your affirmation. This is what you practice. This is the thing that you need to work on to change your inner dialogue so that you stop blaming Tatiana (laughs) for bringing up and simply shining light on your own personal wound. Yeah, and I think that's that's so critically important. And the concept of of shining light on things, and um, for me, has been huge because a lot of, uh, you know, not to to go all the way back, but I mentioned earlier that my father passed away when I was very young, and uh, I remember uh, kind of coping and healing so fast. I remember as a seven year old, I could actually quote unquote game the system. And I knew what I needed to say to the psychologist so that I could get the heck out of those sessions, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and in retrospect, looking back, I healed outwardly way too fast for it to have been a complete healing. And that's, that's the journey that I'm so grateful to be on right now with front row dads, you know, with exchange with Dr. Danny, it's, it's an opportunity to, to take the space that, uh, you know, our financial success, not that that's a prerequisite, but in some capacities, it does, uh, it make it, it allows us to dedicate more bandwidth toward this journey. Um, and it's, it's, I'm just insanely grateful to be on, on that path, because I, it scares me to think about what might have been, had I not come into contact with you and front row dads, or, you know, Dr. Danny, or all of the other positive and powerful influences, if I had been, you know, too busy spending my riches to make those real connections, I could have been 60 and still not have worked through this stuff. We're too busy doing the job too. I mean, we have six pillars in Front Row Dads, one of which is business evolution. And what that means is creating a business that has evolved so that you are not just sitting around bragging about how hard you work, but that how intelligent you approach that process to create a system that can flourish without you so that you can step aside and let somebody else step up to the plate. Let somebody else play the game. Let somebody else evolve in their role, in their position. We can become the problem because we shoulder too much. We want to be in control of too much. We want to cha- you know, be, uh, have a say in every decision that's made for our company versus really understanding what are the values you're building from? What are the frameworks that allow for this thing? The organizational system, right? Um, pull from nature, as Berghoff always talks about, right? And how nature organizes itself and is collaborative that we need in our lives in many, many ways let's go back for a minute and drill down into something that you said a moment ago, which is when we want to become mindful, Mike, how do we do that? Like in a practical sense. So somebody says, okay, but wait, he said, be mindful. How? Yeah, no, it is an excellent question. And, and I can just share what's, what's helped me. Um, And that is in the times of, of clarity, right? Those are when we figure out what are the strategies going to be, right? Don't wait till the next time you've been triggered to try to improv exactly. some sort of mindfulness strategy because it ain't going to work, right? <laughs> um, and, and what Dr. Danny teaches is that um, if we can first come to grips with, it, it's got to be very simple, right? Because if you're in a triggered state, you don't have the mental capacity to execute some complicated strategy, right? Um, so essentially, first step is one, just pause. Take a breath and and recognize what's happening, right? Don't worry about how who am I going to be next or how am I going to move forward? It's just first um, the awareness, right? And if you can become aware, 
take a breath to kind of expand that moment, that gap between uh, stimulus and reaction, you, you can expand that gap to replace the reaction with a response. But again, that's for later. For now, just become aware of it, identify it. And then he, Dr. Danny would suggest to name it, um, right? There's a, the saying, name it to tame it. And while that sounds like I belong with a shrink on a couch, like the idea is, all or writing is. a kid's book or, or talking <laughs> to a 45 year old entrepreneur, <laughs> father of two, it all works. Right, right, right. Um, but the idea is that uh, by naming it, what you're doing is you're bringing the frontal uh, cortex, the neocortex back online. And yeah. there's a, a uh, uh, mutual exclusivity. It's not 100% cut and dry, excuse me, but the more your thinking brain is online, the quieter your lizard brain becomes and vice versa. So we're just consciously choosing to bring that thinking brain back online. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, you, you know, I remember um, uh, some of what Dr. Danny taught by way of what Berghoff has shared with the group, by way of what you've shared with the group. Uh, I've been hearing about Dr. Danny for quite some time. What, what else, if we had one other thing that we could share, Mike, with the guys is an important takeaway from your work with, with Dr. Danny that guys need to know today and maybe gives them like, you know, uh, a, a little bit of a nudge to perhaps even go pick up Dr. Danny's book um, and then to, uh, to dig into that, to take it even further or dig into Front Row Dads and come join the conversation where we're taking it further. But what's, what's one more thing? Yeah, I would. So I have to share this with you. And I, I'm going to read it because uh, I've been reading it daily since I went through the experience and it, it ties together. I don't know that this is something new relative to what we've already discussed. But the question that I'm asking myself on a regular basis right now is, am I running on the neurochemistry of love and creativity? Or on the neurochemistry of fear and reactivity? Right? Ooh. So it's, um, let's say that again. That's, yeah. that's a good one. And, and I have to give full credit, Dan, Dr. Danny asked this specific question um, during the event, and it struck me like a brick. Um, it was, again, am I running on the neurochemistry of love and creativity? That's that upward spiral. Or on the neurochemistry of fear and reactivity, which is that downward spiral. Mm. Wow, man. That's worth the price of admission right there. And, and I would agree I, in that moment. And that was early on in the training that he did with exchange in that moment. I was like, to steal your words, I was in bonus time instantly. I didn't need to get anything else out of the next three days for it to have been worth 10 times what I invested to be there. Um, oh, that's awesome. And how has that continued to play out for you specifically? Like when you, like how, how is that question continuing to show up? Is that something you ask yourself on a regular? Do you journal about that in the morning? Is that written down and hung up somewhere? How do you keep that present for you? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm big at creating um, little signs that I'll see all over. So I'll put it at the, you know, on the fold of my laptop or on my desk here. Um, and, and just as that continual reminder, uh, but dude, it has shown up uh, in quite literally every aspect of my life over the last eight to 12 weeks, whatever it's been. And uh, from the way I deal and, and uh, offer correction to my children, right. Yeah. Uh, rather than responding uh, out of reactivity, I'm able to uh, kind of revert into a chosen cycle of creativity and love and respond to them in a way that uh, is far healthier, both for them as well as for me. Yeah. Right. Um, same is true in my business, using it, um, that same thing to help my clients understand if, if what's holding them back is fear and just offering them the framework so that they can unstick themselves, yeah. right? We use it in enrollment at, to, to help our potential clients understand what it is the storage rebellion is all about. It, yeah, I get it. It's dingy garages. But if that's where you think this ends, it might not be for you because here's where we're really headed with it. And I, I believe the mission uh, of my company evolved with my introduction to Dr. Danny. And now we, um, 
we've extrapolated our true calling to something far greater than it used to be. If you had to sum up what we talked about today in as few words or in as few sentences as possible, what has this call been about for you? For me, it is all about the, the cycle of creativity, the, the law of reciprocity, using the law of reciprocity, giving and receiving uh, as a way to be and become our best self. And uh, that is something that, that Dr. Danny's work can absolutely, I think, support all of us uh, in achieving. Yeah, I, I, would, I would also, endo- I would say the same. And I would argue to say that my lesson versus being prescriptive, like, here's what all you guys need to do. My lesson has been that whenever I see a problem outside of myself, it's typically an indication of something that needs to be worked on within myself. And you can give that all the intellect that you want, but until you truly embrace that, because it'd be like, yeah, I know that it's, it's a lot of like inner work and it's me, but that person's really fucked up. <laughs> I don't think that rule applies in this case. You know, it's like we could sell ourselves really well, but it, it really is the work within us. And I, I now conditioned that when I hop on a phone with hop on the phone with Nathaniel or on Zoom, that I'm like, I know I'm going to convince that this is Tatiana's fault, but by the end of the call, I'm going to be convinced it's mine. <laughs> And always gets me there, always, even though intellectually, I understand that I'm going to get there. I'm emotionally resistant. I'm like, I'm going to get him this time, right? Like, I'm going to, I'm going to prove to him that Tatiana is the one to blame. Um, This has been great. If guys had to take one action, right, in the next 24 hours, what would they do with this information? Yeah, man, that's an excellent question. And I would just encourage them because you and I just shared our takeaways from this work and this conversation, um, I would encourage them to right now before it's, you know, onto the back burner, spend five or 10 minutes reflecting on where can they apply this. And it doesn't have to be something overly profound. It can just be in one, uh, where do they get triggered? And do they want to continue in that uh, triggered state? Or is what we've talked about something that they could utilize to, uh, to maybe pivot from there into something more, more productive or beneficial for everybody. Um, of course, I would tell everybody to grab Dr. Danny's book. The other thing is, you know, I think it's really important that you and I had this conversation between just the two of us. We allowed others to eavesdrop in and there's tons of value there, but the value is compounded exponentially, I believe, when there's more voices participating, right? And so this would be, you'll, you'll probably get mad at me for plugging Front Row Dad so bluntly, but if people aren't actively engaging in the community, checking out, checking it out just to see what it's about, um, and then if it feels like a good fit, diving into it, the, you know, selfishly, I'm saying this because I want as many awesome dudes who, who get it, who want to explore this stuff. They don't have all the answers, but they want to become the best version of themselves. I want those guys around me because I know that this conversation would be a tenfold more valuable if we had eight of us talking about the same stuff, which is exactly what I hope to do yeah, in some capacity right. next week, next right? Week. That's right, man. That's exactly right. Yeah, next week we've got Darius um, Mirshazadeh doing values, family values with us. Um, we've got a conversation led by Hal Elrod on, you know, uh, our family's future and do all sorts of stuff and a few things, a few surprises in there. So I'm pumped about it, dude. We got this house. It's a big dome. I saw that. Killer. All right. So, uh, what I would say to add to that for anybody out there listening, and I recognize a couple of things, one, about 25% of our audience are females. So what's up ladies? Um, love that you can apply all these principles as well, that so much of this is unisex and just you're a human. So go after it for the men out there. If you are not part of our community, grab a buddy and talk about this. Uh, Take somebody out for a walk, a jog, go to the gym, get coffee, grab a beer, whatever it is, and have a talk about this, like spark the conversation. Uh, If you are a part of Front Row Dads, uh, which many of our listeners are, talk about this in your next band gathering, talk about it, bring it up with other guys in the group. We have special 
threads on, you know, on our, our texting system where you can engage in these conversations. And for those of you in the brotherhood, we have our vault, our resource center, go check out Berghoff's training. The replay of the video is there on the neuroscience of leadership. And he will give you a visual explanation of a good bit of what we talked about. He draws it out and it will show you in pictures how to how to look at all these things and how to apply them in your life. And that really helps in many ways to, to see the visual elements of it. So go, go check out Berghoff's training. And uh, also while you're in the vault accessing these resources, go watch Mike Wagner's uh, call where he brought on all these really cool dudes Aaron Amuchastegui, who he and his wife wrote the five hour school week, go check out his call all on, on alternative schooling options, right? I, I don't remember exactly what the name was alternative education, something. If you type in alternative, you'll get there. Anyway, um, go go check those out. And Mike, I, I, you didn't know I was going to ask you this, but I'm gonna ask anyway, you do some kick ass work with with storage rebellion, give a short preview because somebody out there is listening going dude sounds like a cool business model buys back some of my time you have a whole program that teaches people how to do this give a, a quick preview so they can know if they can jump in and learn more yeah in a nutshell what we do is uh we invest in self-storage facilities underperforming undervalued properties we buy them and uh, optimize them, turn them around to maximize our profit. We either keep them for cash flow to fund our lifestyle, whatever that might be, or we sell them uh, for the windfall of cash to, to redeploy it elsewhere in, in some other passive or residual investment. Um, uh, very much in accordance with uh, the principles that Justin Donald teaches in, in his book, uh, The Lifestyle Investor. Um, and more recently, uh, because our financial needs are met, I started the Storage Rebellion uh, people can check it out at storagerebels.com. It's essentially uh, a platform that I built to uh, selfishly uh, tap into my highest level needs and, and essentially pay it forward. I believe very strongly that all the blessings in my life are not mine to keep, but mine to share. And the Storage Rebellion is where we do that. We teach people how to invest in storage units, dingy garages, as a way to create an extraordinary life for themselves so that they can then um, elevate humanity in some way, uh, whatever that is to them, being a better father, being a better husband, being a better philanthropist, uh, whatever it looks like for them, we want to empower them toward that. Very cool. Mike, thanks for being here, brother. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Always so fun and enlightening to, to, to be in conversation with you. So thank you again, man. Any final words from your side? No, man, just just words of appreciation and gratitude for you, brother, for Front Row Dads, and and of course, Dr. Danny and John Berghoff and everybody else that we we talked about today. I, I, uh, I'm i so grateful to have been exposed to all these incredible resources, and all of them, for me, started through Front Row Dads. It's awesome. Well, guys, um, last time on the show, we made an offer that if you, uh, and it was a conversation with Justin Donald, who you just brought up, I, I had I had said it kind of in passing at the very beginning, but I just said, hey, if you, if you, if you dig this, uh, go write a review, screenshot it, mention Justin Donald, send it to Rachel, and we will mail you a copy of Justin's book. And several people took us up on that offer. Um, I want to extend that offer again to, um, for this call to honor Dr. Danny and his life and his work. So if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, write a review on the show, mention Mike Wagner or Dr. Danny uh, and his work leading well with the, within. Send us a screenshot of that and a mailing address and we will mail you a copy of Dr. Danny's book to honor his work and, and to thank you for taking a moment to tell us what you think about these podcast interviews. Um, if you have suggestions, by the way, on who we should have on future shows or topics you'd like to see, just email us. Uh, email me directly, john, J-O-N, at frontrowdads.com. Mike Wagner, um, thanks again for being here, man. I uh, hope everybody connects with you, learns about Storage Rebellion. Guys, we'll put all the notes from this episode at frontrowdads.com. And if you want to join the Brotherhood, there's a join link on the main website, and you can learn more there. Take care, boys. See you soon, Mike.